Hey everyone, my name is Mike Vaughn. I'm a writer for Geek Vibes Nation, and I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Strange Cinema. And I'm Dylan Gonzalez. I'm the editorial director of GeekVibesNation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. And welcome to a new Video Attic new release roundup. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, what we do is we go back and forth. We talk about the latest home video releases. Some are good, some are bad, some are like, so our our bottom of the barrel is Candyman 3 so far. Mm -hmm. um, will we yeah. find a new bottom of the barrel? <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe. Maybe even on this episode. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but with that, I'm mm -hmm. going to kick it off to you. I appreciate it. Uh, one thing about the Candyman thing, I am covering a release from that label on this episode, so... Stick around to see whether or not this new release hits that level Ooh. of quality. <laughs> but first, I'm going to start us off. Okay, like longtime viewers know, we we love everything, like all genres, but we cover a lot, a lot of dark stuff because that just seems to be what most of the labels are releasing. <laughs> so I'm going to keep us like grounded in something more pure and innocent, starting off at least. It'll, it'll escalate. Uh, <laughs> but I'm starting off with Disney's classic, cinderella on 4k uh and i as i was hinting at before the recording i'm not going to go deep into this uh, story because it's cinderella and literally i think every single person knows it because it's a kid's movie so even kids know cinderella um but uh this if you haven't seen it in a while and you're just kind of just familiar with it from like childhood or just from years back this is still like a really just like lovely adaptation of the story just like a really just a fantastic piece of artwork it's very short but it's like what i really wanted to like focus on especially with this 4k upgrade this time around which is all the like animation details that are kind of included um like uh in in this original artwork and just seeing all the nuances that come out like all of this like hand-drawn animation is just really gorgeous and i like disney like they kind of set the bar early on and there's a reason why they kind of reign supreme in every aspect of our lives. Uh, but it's such a fun, breezy story, great songs, um, just like good character work. And it's just a, like a really simple story that just sort of kind of warms your heart every time you watch it. And uh, I think uh, for a while now, this has been out in like high definition and everything for years, but this 4K release really kind of elevates things. And people may already be familiar with this release because it was released earlier this year through the Disney Movie Club. So the most adamant Disney fans may already have this. But uh, after months of being uh, exclusively on that, it's getting a wide release. And the 4K presentation is exceptional. Um, from what I read online, I believe this was like carried out by the restoration team in Japan. And they really like did some impeccable work here of just like cleaning up all like kind of any like minor deficiencies, but also enhancing the original artwork to a place where some of the previous Blu-ray releases kind of uh, like kind of scrubbed out some of the detail, like some of the line work was just completely eliminated, like on like the dress, like the ripples of the dress kind of just got smoothed over into like a white blob in some of the previous releases. So those are kind of been restored and you see the actual texture of this animation through this 4k restoration. So it's just a really a, a visual treat to watch this with uh, in 4k with high uh, HDR, high dynamic range. Um, all the like colors really pop. Like I said, so much detail in the animation. Um, there is a, a sheen of film grain that still remains. It's very fine, uh, but it is there. It has not been like a DNR to away. So um, people who are kind of con been concerned about some of like the restoration, some of these bigger companies have been doing in the recent years. This one has been like well-preserved and uh, it has DTS 5.1 sound. That sounds really great. And um, also this release specifically made me long for the days where Disney really cared about providing a lot of special features and digging into their archives and stuff, because just going through all these special features, I'm like, Oh yeah, they used to be kind of the leader in this regard. It's just like having like these like lavish, like two or three disc like features for their classic animated tales where you would just kind of learn so much about the artistic process. And they're not really doing that with their new releases, but like you have, like a 39 minute documentary on the making of, and then like four or five 
additional featurettes dealing with different um, aspects of the production, like the inspiration for the fairy godmother character, some of the songs, like the uh, the iconic like glass slipper and kind of like collaborations I've done um, with that. It's just a really well-rounded release that looks like audio visual wise, fantastic special features, uh, like I said, no complaints at all. Um, but the 4K release of Cinderella really knocks it out of the park. So if you're a fan of classic animation, this really does the trick. And like, I know it's just kind of a tale that you take for granted because it's so well known, but it, it is, it's a great movie. So like, if you haven't seen it in a while, return to it and just like, just take in and just kind of like appreciate it for really kind of how it like broke all this ground for all these Cinderella stories that we've gotten <laughs> over the past several decades because it kind of like established like the bar very high. Yeah, um, I'm really happy that that is a really great release. Like, mm -hmm. uh, when I saw it was coming out, I had high hopes, so that's uh, great. Um, hopefully there'll be some more really great uh, classic Disney 4K releases in the future. Yes. So, um, long-time viewers will know uh, we love um, music docs and you know, anything that to do with music and particularly preserving stuff uh, from like the um, early days of jazz and, and rock and, and all these different genres. And that brings me to my next title, uh, Soundies, <laughs> The Ultimate Collection. Now, um, you might be asking yourself, what is Soundies? Um, <laughs> and I did not know that either. So, um, but uh, it basically was um, these uh, short length, um i guess they were like many present um like little presentations of like performances um that were produced from 1940 to 1946 um a lot of them have just barely survived um and um this is what's really nice about this is for anybody that's like maybe a big fan of the sound um soundies uh this is great if you are like me and you're new to it um there's a lot of background context um there's a booklet inside which i will show you um really cool and yeah so um basically uh you get uh, a historian talking about what they're going to show you as far as like um, just a primer uh, into the um, soundy segments uh, themselves. And uh, I loved it. I thought it was a really great way to sort of like ease newcomers in like myself. Um, and then with all that context and they kind of show you um, the restored um, presentation Um and yeah, it's it's really phenomenal. Um, like, it's kind of breaks my heart that some of these maybe didn't survive, or some were maybe like, um, like she was explaining that sometimes some of the, like the title cards were like missing. Sometimes they would like cut things. Um, this I guess was from a um, none of the original elements i think survived uh they also do explain that um so a lot of this is like sourced from like the best possible like home video or archival uh material available um and that's just to say it's all been exquisitely archived um curated um some really nice features um yeah, this is excellent. Uh, Kino Classics really did an amazing job. They work with the Library of Congress on this one. Um, that right there, I think, should kind of say it all. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's really fantastic. Um, just like the sheer amount of talent uh, on display. Um, they were talking about the importance of like women performers and how that was kind of rare and groundbreaking. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it just gives you a lot of this really amazing context and then sort of like, does it just throw you into it? Like it gives you a nice little uh, primer on that because I I don't really he hear a lot about this being talked about. So I don't know like how well known it is maybe to like hardcore, like music lovers, especially like um like older 
music. I don't know. Are you are you were you familiar with this prior to? Uh, I was not. I saw that the release was announced, and then you messaged me. And you're like, "Oh, this will be right up your alley," and I was like, "I completely agree. I'm very excited <laughs> about it." But uh, I I did not know about this whole kind of uh, set of like this artistic medium uh but uh it kind of reminds me how you're speaking about it like almost like the uh set that i talked about like cinema's first nasty women where mm. it gives you like this rich like history and like um array of different things that you might not ever otherwise get to see but like you said just creating a great amount of context and just like letting you know like this is how this was developed this is like what the time it was released and here's why it's special this is why we like gathered this in this collection so i think that's very exciting that they keep doing different collections like that for different like lost art like artwork that would would be remain lost if it wasn't for efforts like these yeah and um you know like i said it um they didn't just like dump this out i i love the attention to detail the 44 page booklet um was really fun to read um i did that before i jumped into the set as like like an like an extra sort of primer but yeah. um yeah like they have you covered if you just like want to just jump into the disc because like they 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 really lay out the information and and um uh, what you're about to watch in a really interesting and engaging way so uh i highly recommend this uh i wanted to start my since you started on a positive note I feel yeah. like, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Soundies, the ultimate collection. It is the ultimate collection. Uh, I love uh, I love it. Um, this is definitely something that I feel like um, I can put on, um, like, on a lazy Sunday and watch and appreciate, and music fans uh, will definitely want to do that as well. Yes, very excited about that set. Um, and I... If I would have known you were talking about it then, I might have structured my stuff differently because I do have something that would have been a nice segue into that title. But uh, I have a different, I'll get back <laughs> to that later. <laughs> uh, my next title is one I'm very excited about. It's one of probably the premier releases of August, in my opinion. Um, and it's the new Criterion Collection release. Of, I'm going to probably butcher this. Bo Werderberg's New Swedish Cinema, uh, which first off, I want to say this this is kind of seems like unusual packaging for the Criterion Collection. I haven't seen like a, like a just a straight plastic case like uh, release like this. Usually, it's kind of like a, like a cardboard digit pack if they're going to do a multi disc release. But um, this comes with a booklet, which I'll show off in just a second. But there's four discs here for the four movies. Um, each has their own little hub here. Um, and I, instead of taking every disc out, I'll take the artwork out so you can kind of see the background artwork. Ooh, and, ooh this is thick paper. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Uh, so it's just kind of like a scenic backdrop, which is nice. Uh, but I just, it really did take me aback about, because usually whenever, whenever you take out these uh, covers, they're usually pretty thin, but this is like a thick cardstock. <laughs> uh, but uh, this booklet here it's really nice it kind of gives you a little bit about each film and like some nice essays about uh Bo Werderberg and kind of his place in uh Swedish cinema and what I found really interesting like I said you read the book before going into your last release and I kind of did the same um what I found really interesting about this filmmaker is um uh the earliest film in this was from 1963 and a little bit prior to that he uh had this before getting into directing he had kind of taken shots at the swedish film industry of just kind of um talking about how they had kind of become complacent and were kind of making uh films that uh didn't speak to society as it was in the present and stuff and he even like as much as he is like a iconic filmmaker he even lumped in like uh ingrid uh, ingmar bergman into this and uh, which there's like some interesting uh, like writings about how Ingmar is just kind of like, I mean, I agree kind of like I, I've been kind of like in a creative rub, but then he just kind of came back with like a stone cold masterpiece and persona. So kind of uh, sh they kind of like were kind of uh, neutral allies throughout most of their career. But what Bo decided to do whenever he started getting into filmmaking 
is he did want to make that kind of class conscious uh, filmmaking that kind of was like more raw and gritty and just kind of spoke to people uh, of Sweden. Um, so there's, like I said, there's four films in this and I'll kind of go through each of these very quickly because I don't want to keep people here all day, but these are all really great in their own distinct ways. And I found him to be a really interesting filmmaker because it's just each tale, while some thematic things carry over, there's a lot that like kind of evolves and like morphs and just like different subject matters are really interesting. The first one and kind of the most like insular is called The Baby Carriage. Um, it's his debut. And it's a black and white film just about a girl who's kind of striving for independence and she's living with her parents and she kind of like starts seeing like a couple of different guys and she ends up getting pregnant and she's like uh, dealing with that, trying to figure out what she wants to do with her life and how she can properly choose what is right for her uh, moving forward. So it's it's kind of like uh, like dreamy as like this girl walks like or goes throughout the city just kind of experiencing different uh, uh, facets of the city life and just kind of like figuring out who she is in this world. It's very fascinating. It's just like it's very low key, but I found it to be very effective, especially with the black and white filmmaking. Um, it's just very humanistic and just I really ended up enjoying it quite a bit. Um, the, his next feature uh, was uh, Raven's End, which is more uh, uh, strictly like a kind of a class conscious narrative. It's set a couple of decades prior to the film in the 30s, uh, right around kind of like on that rise kind of of like Nazism, but it's not strictly a movie about that. It's more about the struggles of like the working class as opposed to just um, like the like dealing with class disparity and just kind of uh, different interpersonal dramas, how the the characters' lots in life have kind of been impacted by not having a lot of money and how like class struggle isn't just about like, I don't have enough money to eat. It can kind of just like affect your upward mobility and kind of like what your, what possibilities are open to you on the kind of a number of different things. I, it's probably my least favorite of the four, but it's still very good for a set that's like pretty great throughout. Um, I still find this to be very compelling and really good. Um, his third film uh, in this set is uh, Elvira Madigan, which is also kind of a period piece. And, but he kind of shakes things up a little bit where there is kind of like the class consciousness um, aspect of this, but it's also kind of like a, a romance, like a, irresponsible romance it's about two people who kind of are they each are kind of I, I won't dive deep into the plot but each of them kind of have their own responsibilities that they're supposed to be uh in but they kind of like run away from their lives and run away with each other and like kind of like this whirlwind romance but ultimately they are kind of faced with the fact that they are in a position where um their financial security keeps going down and down and like everything just kind of like the rush of like this young love quickly kind of turns sour as like they are kind of faced with like reality and it is kind of tragic and I like I won't go through like all the different beats that it hits but just it's a very character and like character centric intimate drama uh that's like beautiful but also heartbreaking but I will say this film uh it kind of like uh, ekes up a little bit higher in the rankings for me because it has some of the most beautiful cinematography I've seen like this is com uh, pretty much completely filmed with natural lighting which I talk about in one of the special features um, and it's just like beautiful shots of nature and just the characters the way they kind of linger on the characters it's just really great but my favorite film of this one is the the final one which is um, uh, Adeline 31 which is very uh, prescient to uh, things that we're going through today because it is about a, um, a labor strike that is going on within this town in Sweden and um, kind of them trying to like, they're on like the third or fourth month of a labor strike and tensions are kind of like bubbling to the, to the forefront. And this is actually inspired by a real life event that happened in Sweden um, where uh I, would, I guess I'll just say this because it, it doesn't directly parallel what happens in the movie, but it's inspired by it. Like where there was like kind of a workers revolt in the strike where um, several people ended up getting killed by kind of the people in charge. And it kind of led to like a, uh, like a 
coming together the community to kind of like fight for fair labor so that that's kind of the real life event and then the this fictional event uh there are elements of this uh woven throughout but it kind of tells its own distinct story and it's very impactful and i know like yeah like the sag and like wga strikes are different from just like a pure like labor strike but each are just groups that are coming together to try to like have fair pay and everything and just the way this movie is executed is just so uh impressive i really like it's it's the longest of the movies but it's the one that felt the shortest because i was so like gripped by the narrative it's just a very interesting movie um and this set it does like i these four movies are great and they all look great these all come from new uh restorations all look really nice um especially the latter two movies but all four of them look really nice um the the lpcm 1.0 uh swedish audio comes through crisp and clear everything's come th through nicely um each disc has at least a couple special features on it um usually either a newer interview with uh there's one newer interview with someone who did wasn't directly connected uh to uh Werderberg. But I understand why they include it because it's uh, from uh, Ruben Ostlin, who did uh, Triangle of Sadness, which was just nominated for uh, Best Picture this year. He kind of talks about how he was inspired by uh, Werderberg. But then there's also other people who there's like a, one of the actors from the film who's now an old man. And also another older gentleman uh, who was like uh, the uh, uh, cinematographer. They both gave new interviews in 2021, which are included. There's also some vintage interviews from like some different news programs. Uh, where uh, Werderberg is talking about his, like uh, the different movies on the different disc. Um, so a really nice selection of special features, looks nice, sounds great. So if you're interested in like uh, learning more about Swedish cinema and kind of how it was shaped by kind of some of these maverick filmmakers, this one's a really great set. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a good investment if you're a cinephile because it's just the Criterion Collection that usually unearths some kind of like pocket of filmmaking i haven't heard about or like i haven't explored as thoroughly as i want and this was the perfect occasion and i had a fantastic time nice um yeah that sounds uh again that all i mean um criteria never really steers you wrong especially with like their um curated uh sets um swedish cinema cinema swedish <laughs> cinema that's hard to say um yeah. Uh, is a blind spot for me so that actually feels like something that uh would be really interesting to check out especially uh with you know the one title being very relevant as you were saying to kind of what's going on uh right now so yeah we've been talking about some very classy stuff and that's great we love that <laughs> but um i want to like sleaze it up a little bit here um of course of course <laughs> so um uh, Mono Macabre, it always has uh, your back when it comes to really uh, good, like Euro cinema, weird stuff. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about Night of the Executioner. Um, so um, this was filmed, it, this is kind of interesting, like a little tangent, and then I'll get into it. But um, this uh, was billed as his as, um, Paul Nashie's last film. Um, which is technically true, although it was the last to be released. It was released in 99, this the year that he died. But I think mm. this, I believe this was filmed in like the early 90s. So I'm not quite sure why there was the release gap, but technically, yes, his final film. Um, and I'm a big uh, fan of this uh, director. He's a, he was a director um writer actor he he um was often in his own movies like this uh so yeah this is basically like death wish but like make it like sleazier and make it more like euro-y so there you have it um that's my review um no it's um it's... okay my next title is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh I like I, I like that premise. I think that's a great jumping off point. I kind of love um, movies that sort of take um, a blockbuster premise and sort of makes it their own. This movie starts off really solid, too, but I will say it really sags in the middle. Like, 
it's very similar to Death Wish, where um, it's this regular guy, his family is assaulted in a in a really horrific home invasion attack, and um, he basically seeks revenge um, after getting out of the hospital. The problem is, that's a I mean that's a very solid setup, and. I'm excited for, like I said, whenever a film sort of takes, borrows uh, another premise. But, like, it just tries to fit in a lot of these subplots that I feel like aren't necessary. It just sort of, like, bogs the movie down. And I feel like it just needed a more straightforward, focused narrative. Um, The third act does pick up. There is a a really brutal dick removal scene. (laughs) Oof. So there's a trigger warning <laughs> if that's um, particularly triggering. Um, but it's it's a fun time. I just wish the pacing would have been better. I mean, this is really not one of my favorite uh, film of his. And if you're new to, to Paul Nashi, I think like this probably would not be maybe the one to start with. I still think Panic Beats is like my all time favorite. But like you you have his like classic werewolf movies. And yeah, there's like a lot of better films to sort of get into uh, from him. But I like that um, as a completist, I'm excited that this is out. Uh, This is from a new uh, 4K scan, so it looks great. We do have um, a really great audio commentary track. Those who got the um, Red Case edition, which is like their limited edition. Um, there's a booklet in that. This one doesn't have that, um, as you can see. But yeah, um, I'm, I'm. It's the movie's fine. I'm just as a fan though. I'm excited that I have it in my collection. Uh, I watch anything that he's involved in. So yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I'm not. I haven't uh, dug deeply into that director. I've seen some box sets from him come out that I've been kind of interested in, but I haven't dug in yet. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll test him out with this and then maybe see, like go more expensive with a box set and go yeah. from there. My next title, uh, this this is probably the first time this movie will probably uh, compared to Cinderella, but it, just because of <laughs> uh, <laughs> release strategy, uh, this is from Fun City Editions and this is uh, Morvan Caller. Uh, this came out last year uh, through their partnership with Vinegar Syndrome um, and kind of like there's like special limited edition uh, set up. But now it's kind of give, been given a more standard wider release. Uh, so now I'm checking it out uh, and I'm glad because I was very excited to plug in this hole in my Lynn Ramsey filmography because she is one of my favorites. Uh, our for the site, I reviewed her debut from the Criterion Collection, uh, Rat Catcher. Uh, but some, one of my favorite films of the past like decade or so uh, is the Joaquin Phoenix film, You Were Never Really Here. Uh, mm-hmm. And she also directed uh, you, uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin. So she's like throwing out Stone Cold Bangers all the time. So I was interested to check out Morven Caller. Uh, so four films in 20 years. She needs to make more, but everything she does is great. So I can't really fault that. Uh, so for those who haven't seen this one, stars Samantha Morton as the titular Morvan Caller, who uh, during Christmas holiday, which I actually, you know this, mm. uh, I actually watched this as a part of our Christmas in July celebration that me and my wife did <laughs> recently. So oh, this nice. is kind of like a dark Christmas movie to kind of inject into that. Um, but this takes place during the Christmas holiday. And uh, one day, uh, Morvan, uh, she wakes up and her boyfriend that she lives with has died by suicide. And he's left uh, this note that kind of like says like why he did it and kind of also giving instructions. He was a, uh, he was a writer and kind of like giving her instructions on how to get his work out uh, out to, um, to like publishers and stuff and get his work published. Um, but uh, as if anyone who's familiar with Lynn Ramsey's work, she deals with like kind of um, trauma and grief and stuff in very interesting ways. And what Morvan decides to do is pretty much she hides the fact that her boyfriend has uh, died by suicide and also I, like in a state of kind of like uncertainty and like not clear headedness, she decides 
to take his work and kind of present it as her own is maybe like a her own ticket out of this town um so it's kind of like her and her friend are kind of like going on this kind of odyssey they end up in spain uh, to about like approaching publishers to potentially like publish this book and her, it's also but at the along this journey is her kind of like figuring out where she wants to be in this world how she's like dealing with the death of her boyfriend um how she's dealing with how that brings up past traumas of being kind of abandoned by her family and also just like not feeling worth that giving her like a sense of not feeling worthy to like of like greatness and stuff and kind of like trying to break out of this kind of lot she's finding herself in life and it's a very interesting movie it's very like said character based and very personal but I really I think Samantha Morton does such a great job it's it's not like a movie full of like dramatic revelations or and it's not one that's going to hold your hand you don't really get a scene of Morvan just being like yeah remember like I this like basically like this is my childhood tragedy you have to kind of like pick up on that and kind of pick up on different aspects of her character because Lynn she doesn't she doesn't hold your hand through any of her narratives you have to kind of like engage with the movie pick up on what like a little bit of like uh because she's a photographer by trade originally so she's more interested in, in observation rather like than telling uh which is great I think for filmmakers that they want to make real art um but this is such a, like a, a wonderful movie and I, it's while it's not topping some of my favorites of hers it's still really fantastic and this release is really great um it comes from a 2k scan restoration of the 35 millimeter inner positive it looks really nice it inc like uh captures that natural film grain um it resolves very well it never seems like it's clumpy or swarming or anything like that um, the sound is great. Um, it comes with a very enlightening commentary track, uh, which kind of helps you get even more deep into the themes and kind of how this fits into the work of Lynn Ramsey. And also there's an additional video essay that runs a little bit less than 10 minutes and some trailers and stuff. But if you're a fan of Lynn Ramsey and you don't have this yet, definitely pick it up. It's a really great movie. If you haven't tried out any Lynn Ramsey, she only has four movies. Just go watch them all because I think they're all great. Um, but yeah, definitely highly recommend this Morbin Collar from Fun City Editions. Nice. Um, I've only, I think I've only ever seen We Need to Talk About Kevin. Mm. Um, very heavy, very heavy movie. <laughs> yeah. I was like often like thinking like, what if they did that? It was like the Kevin was like Kevin McAllister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like um very he's just dealing with his trauma from having like a home invasion as a child and yeah, yeah i can see that yeah. um so uh yeah no that sounds interesting um i am new to her stuff so i feel like a binge of her movies are definitely in order um mm -hmm. i'm not talking about one film next i'm talking about mm -hmm. two films uh all right and that is um, also um, from Mondo Macabro, and that is The Broken Mirror and Unquiet Death. Mm. And I mean, got that creepy little boy situation. Uh, here's the back. And uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to start with The Broken Mirror. Um, yeah, it's uh, very slow. If you kind of are uh somebody that doesn't mind like a very slow burn um the broken mirror i feel like you you will be good um it's mm -hmm. definitely one of those movies that i feel like um the plot is just okay but it's really the visuals of the movie that carries uh the film that and the performances um i like when the performances in a movie like this can be slightly uh, stylized and maybe a little bit on the weird side, but I think that kind of works uh, for films like this. Um, like I can't say enough about the photography; it's really fantastic. Um, uh, Max von Sydow is in this. Uh, it's interesting seeing him in like a really weird sort of slow burning kind of gothic horror piece. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it works. I mean, we were talking about Bergman, so 
you know yeah there you go um and um it's fine i think like the i think i was trying to decide if i felt like the payoff was sort of worth the slow build and i feel like to a degree it is it's just a movie that you really have to go with it even though it's a little bit of a, a it's just very slow <laughs> um Unquiet Death, I think, is was probably the more interesting of the two films. Um, it also is a little bit on the slow side, but it definitely offers a little bit more like sleaze. Um, I I really like how the movie talks about like gender, like racism, class, um, classism, and then you know just throws a lot of weird set pieces at you as well. So does it all come together? No, was did I enjoy it still? Yes. Both of these uh have really nice uh features. Um they look terrific. Again, the photography on both of these films are like next level good. So I am really happy that we have a really nice looking presentation for both of these films. And um we'll probably put up a better shot of this, but there is some really great features um on both of these. Um I love that this is a double bill. Both are pretty interesting films. Like I said, I feel like I kind of like one more than the other, but uh, your mileage may vary. And if you are kind of into like weird, slow moving, gothic dramas, then Mono's got you covered. Nice. I'll have to check that out. I uh, This is a tease for a future video addict, but mm-hmm. I have a title uh, I'm covering probably next week. Um, also called Broken Mirror, but I I almost wanted to um, cover it just to mess with our audience, just to be like, what? what? There's two broken... But no, <laughs> I, I'm leaving that for a different episode, just for uh, lack of... Or like to, to avoid confusion. But uh, I'm interested in checking out that other Broken Mirror now that I know that it exists. It's <laughs> a lot of broken glass. It's just a yeah. hazard. It's dangerous. <laughs> But uh, speaking of dangerous, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, from uh, MBD Entertainment and uh, Synergetic. Uh, this is Junkhead, uh, which is a uh, stop motion animated movie, which I talked about another stop motion title in recent weeks. So I'm glad that I've been able to like check out so much stop motion animation recently. Um, this one for anyone who's seen it, this kind of uh, kind of straddles the line closer to something like Phil Tippett's Mad God. Um, it's very, very gnarly and very uh, aimed to adults rather than like. Whereas something like like Coraline or Paranorman or something is like it has its creepy adult elements. This is like directly like grotesque, like weird, like claymation penises and all kinds of stuff so what this basically is is like it's kind of set in like a far off future kind of like dystopian where um there is kind of like a scientist who is tasked with going like to like the underground realm that kind of exists where like these mutants exist because while the humanity has learned kind of the secrets to like a long life they are also inflicted with um, a lack of being able to procreate. Uh, so they have the the scientist kind of t- like goes underground to kind of find like the secret formula or secret like tenant where they can figure out how to start procreating again. <laughs> um, and he he loses his body basically and like gets transported into like this other like robot version there's a couple different kind of like bodies his 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 mind gets transformed into or like transferred into and it's just kind of him trying to hang on to his humanity remembering kind of a life before and also trying to accomplish his mission while he is down there and like i said there's a lot of really weird creature designs this is a more like visual experience and rather than like narrative based it's just kind of like grotesque vibes so if you're into that i think you'll enjoy it um the 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 story's fine i think it goes on maybe a little bit too long but it's not like an overly long movie it's like an hour 41 minutes uh probably could shaved a little bit off but it's, it's not it's like it doesn't make you like check your watch too many times or anything 
um stop motion animation is really great i loved all like the textures on all like the different models and everything and there's also some like dark humor throughout which i really appreciate one thing i will mention is um this is completely subtitles because pretty much throughout they are kind of making us like speaking of like a made up gibberish language and it's kind of just translated i think there is some actual japanese thrown in there but that's also just translated um but overall junkhead it's a fun time and this blu-ray is pretty good it visually looks really nice i was a little bit disappointed that it's only a dolby digital 2.0 track instead of a dts so i wish there had been a lossless audio track but overall it doesn't sound bad i just i'm greedy and i want the best audio uh, visually it looks nice there's like a i believe a 42 minute making of it's pretty much just like a fly on the wall look at just the creation of different um like aspects of the production um but it's a it's really interesting to see how kind of things are built from the ground up yeah so that's pretty much what we got here and it's a entertaining movie pretty standard blu-ray but overall i think if you're interested in stop motion animation especially for adults um i think it's worth checking out nice um yeah that is one that i had heard of um haven't actually seen so i'm excited now that you said it's pretty cool and <laughs> Um, I liked Mad God. It it movie was just a lot, <laughs> but yeah, yeah like, I get that. This is more narrative based than Mad God. Like there okay. is like more of a A to B plot, but there there it does have some elements of like just vibes like Mad God. Mm. Nice. So my next title is one that's actually pretty uh, important as far as like um, movie musicals. Uh, I know we're both mm -hmm. fans um, mm -hmm. to various degrees. I know you more than my me, but. This is technically the first complete sound musical uh, and the first sound film to win a, a Best Picture Oscar. Uh, 1929's The Broadway Melody. And um, it was pretty good. I will say, like, it always astonishes me, like, some of, like, the absolute savage burns uh, that are in these old films. Um, first of all, have you seen this yet? I've seen like the first 20 minutes. I didn't get to, I had okay. to prepare for this show, so I didn't get to finish it yet. Yeah. Do you were, uh, I think this was in the, in the first 20 minutes. So there's a character that like stutters really bad. And uh, I, you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where she's like, uh, changed a record. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yeah, it's a fun time. Um, I I think that um, you definitely can see where this movie thrives more as being a pre-code. Um, there wasn't anything like super scandalous, but there's like um, some like entendres. There's definitely some like innuendos. There is um, like a changing scene where they're not like naked, but like, it's definitely more skin than probably what they would be able to. Um, and in like maybe six years from when this movie was made. Um, so I always find that fascinating with pre-code movies. Um, the musical numbers are really well done, especially when you consider that this was sort of the blueprint for movie musicals. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think they do a really good job. Um, and this movie was a huge hit. It made a lot of money, and it kind of makes me wonder if it had flopped, um, would studios be uh, uh, as interested in making like, um, like other like movie musicals, um, and like would the whole genre have maybe just imploded? Um, so I don't know, but it uh did really well. So um, yeah um fun it's just it's very like the melodrama is just a lot and that can be fun i feel like it veers into camp territory which is that sort of sweet spot of like it's very over the top but it's so over the top that it's kind of like that's the fun of it um and it's a little soap opera -y, but it's fun i like the musical numbers i thought they were really well choreographed um pretty catchy um yeah, I, I thought it was really engaging. I thought maybe it still could have like maybe used a 20 minute trim. Um, 
but yeah, uh, I liked it. Um, when you're finished, I would love to hear what you think. Cause, um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting to like, see sort of like the absolute beginning of like a movie genre, literally. Yeah. Yeah. That's one that I've always heard about because people always kind of criticize it as like maybe one of the worst best picture winners, like along with like greatest show on earth, people are just like, uh, oh, these two. And then I guess like crash. Like those are like, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I really didn't think it was bad. I just, I, I, I guess I can see like the melodrama being just a lot mm-hmm. can find kind of great on, on you, but like, I, I I mean, if you dig musicals, that's exactly what it gives you. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I assume since this is from Warner Archive, it, like, looks fantastic. Yeah. Um. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to get into that. Um. Yeah, it looks uh, really good. Um. Again, it's probably as pristine as you're likely going to see. Like I said, this was from, from 1929. Um. This is almost 100 years old. <laughs> but um really i mean they must be working with really good um uh, material because um even for a movie that's almost 100 years old um i didn't see a lot in the way of like debris or scratches i mean even the audio like with some of your really early kind of sound films you get like mm-hmm. a crackly um sort of like sometimes maybe tinny sort of sound quality but um i didn't really uh detect that here so um you know that's because it's always and and like when i watch stuff i usually have like noise canceling headphones so any kind of like crackle or anything like that is just it absolutely great on me so uh this wasn't that uh so yeah it was good looks good um uh yeah, if you're a fan of the genre, I feel like you kind of need to see where where it all began. I don't know. I, I again, I didn't think it was like that bad. Like Yeah, and I'm enjoying it so far. So, I mean, yeah. at least try it out. I think some of these are a little bit hyperbolic whenever it comes to the quality of some certain mm-hmm. best picture winners. I'm like, yeah, maybe there were better movies that year, but like it's they're usually pretty fine. And I'm I'm enjoying it so far, so I guess we'll see how I feel by the time we get to the end. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm going to double up on this next uh, segment here. Uh, I am going, I I know we have like the, uh, the silent corner. We have the steamy corner. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm ready now to, to uh, dub the documentary corner. <laughs> Is there such thing as insanity among penguins? I try to avoid the definition of insanity or derangement. I don't mean that uh, a penguin might believe he he or she is Lenin, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, but uh, could they just go crazy because they've had enough of their colony? And here he is heading off into the interior of the vast continent. With 5,000 kilometers ahead of him, he's heading towards certain death. Here we go. <laughs> uh, here's two documentaries. One which is the one I was kind of talking about uh, would complement your Soundies collection. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the Us Festival. Um, the 19, uh, 1982, the Us Generation. Um, So this is a documentary about that, the festival, the US festival. Um, And it it, it was a festival uh, in 1982 that was put on by Steve Wozniak, who was one of the co-founders of Apple. So he's a man richer than God. So Mm -hmm. what did he decide to do? He decided to put on a music festival that would kind of improve on all the kind of the deficiencies of Woodstock, but it would like just, he just wanted to get basically a ton of people together to give them the time of their lives and just like put on like a pretty seamless concert experience. And I wasn't really sure what I was getting into with this documentary as it, as it started. I didn't know if it would be more like like Woodstock, the documentary where you were getting like really lo- like a nice array of like live performances, like full performances and like context for like the culture at hand and everything. And that movie ended up being like three hours long and i knew this was just around an hour and a half um and 
you don't really get that. This is a very interesting subject that I don't think is given the best documentary treatment. The S Festival seems like really fascinating and what we get to see of it is really cool. Like there's artists such as the B-52s, the Police, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, uh, the Cars, Talking Heads, the Ramones, uh, Fleetwood Mac. Um, so yeah, you have all these like heavy hitters like, uh, like Santana's also in there. And what I really disliked about this documentary is while well, yes, there are a few people, I guess like the B-52s and the Police specifically, and I guess Fleetwood Mac, where you do get an extended look at like the songs that they are performing and everything. But um, a lot of, especially like the cars, you'll get like 15 seconds of a performance and then it'll kind of cut away. And I found the structure of this to be very weird because in addition to the performances, it, it, you're getting like a bunch of talking head documentaries on talking heads, the band, which I'd love more talking heads, the band <laughs> talking head documentaries about kind of how this festival came about, which is also fine but it is the way this is purported is it's basically a festival where nothing went wrong so you're not getting like a lot of the juicy details of like like a fire festival or something like like the woodstock 99 or whatever where like things were being set on fire and everything this is basically a bunch of people being like oh yeah steve had a bunch of money and he just decided to like throw on this festival and he got enough porta potties for everyone and like paid everyone fairly and made sure everyone had enough water and everything and i'm just like okay that's cool <laughs> but like I want to see more of the artists if we're just going to go with like, there's nothing really dramatic happening. Like the most dramatic thing that happened was that Steve was like being too generous with his friends and bringing too many people backstage and like being a little scamp and like forging backstage passes for his friends. And I'm like, okay, that's like, that's funny. But like, that's like the most dramatic thing that happens. So I, and just like some of the editing choices, I just found to be very weird. It kind of seemed like almost like a made for TV movie at some points because like it would like fade in, like it'd be like talking heads performance and then like get like a little clip and then like fade out and say again, like the talking heads at the, and I was just like, this is very weird. Um, so there are elements that I like about this. It's kind of like a decent, like zone out type movie. But if you're looking for like a, the ultimate um document the document on the us festival it kind of it plays it very safe especially since this is i believe also produced by steve wozniak so i think you if anything did go wrong which they just said that nothing went wrong i i don't think he would have found it in this so just kind of i it it kind of left kind of a bad taste in my mouth just because i was like this just doesn't seem very authentic but the release is it's pretty good like the visuals like the video is good this is once again a, uh, especially with this being a music documentary, I was disappointed that this was also a Dolby Digital 2.0 presentation instead of DTS. Especially when you're dealing with music, I want lossless audio. Um, this does come out with a director audio, uh, director commentary track, but it's also one of those commentary tracks where it's just a lot of the director just watching the video for like long stretches of silence and then occasionally chiming in with something that's not super interesting. Uh, so that. I was just like, okay, it's here, but it's not really giving me a lot. Um, but there is like 45 minutes extra, like uh, uninterrupted interviews with like three of the figures, uh, including Wozniak, uh, Mick Fleetwood, and um, who's the other? Uh, Stuart Copeland uh, from the police, I believe. Um, so you do get some good special features like with extended interviews, but the documentary, I, I love the subject. I just don't love the presentation. Um, one that was better for me in documentary um, uh, is this one from Synapse Films, and that is uh, Invaluable, the True Story of an Epic Artist, uh, which tells uh, the uh, story of Tom Sullivan, who was one of the special effects uh, people on The Evil Dead. And this really goes into kind of like the making of The Evil Dead and his uh, career and everything. This does have reversible cover art here is uh, Bruce Campbell on the front uh, but I think this uh, document is pretty decent it's it it leans a little bit less on like playing it safe with the subjects uh, you do I for the for a long part uh, or a large part of the movie I kind of felt like it was almost like kind of like a puff piece um, just kind of being like here's why this guy's so great and just having all of his friends talk about it and 
uh, it did kind of feel weird because it seemed, I'm not sure if either the director was doing the interviews or if it was Tom interviewing his friends, but it seemed like a lot of like being like, Hey, what do you think about me? And then the people would answer. And I'm like, that doesn't really give like an unbiased, like, or like an unvarnished, like, I know people probably thought he was a good guy, but it kind of just felt like, oh, he's asking me, I need to say like good stuff about him. But overall, I did find it to be very interesting. And it did get to a point where certain revelations were made where I was like, oh, this is more dramatic than I thought it was going to be. And I, I'm not I'm not opposed to like a like a good puff piece documentary, if that's kind of what you're looking for. Like this person's great. And this is why they're great. Um, but I, I sometimes do want it to kind of dig a little bit deeper. Um, I could have used a little bit more depth to this one, but overall, I think it's a pretty solid documentary, at least getting to know this great artist. Um, and they don't advertise it prominently, but there's also a, an additional documentary that's included among the special features uh, called Other Men's Careers, uh, which uh, is about filmmaker Josh Becker who is one of the more animated subjects of the uh, main documentary. He's just kind of like, he'll say anything. And like, you just kind of like chuckle at like him being like brash, brash and just like abrasive. And this, uh, this other documentary, which is arguably a little bit more interesting because they kind of just like freely admit that Josh Becker, even though people love him is a huge asshole <laughs> and like has like a lot of problems like with alcoholism and just like he's self-defeating in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's told with love, but it's also kind of more unvarnished, which I find a little bit even more interesting than the main documentary. But while the documentary subject, I don't find him to be particularly likable. <laughs> I find it to be a little bit more interesting. Uh, but together, these complement each other very well since they're, they're interviewing a lot of the same people and you're kind of getting like two sides of a coin, basically. Um, both documentaries look solid and sound great. This does have DTS audio for the, I'm pretty sure at least the main documentary i can't remember if the uh other other men's careers has lost this audio i think it does um this also has a nice array of special features including um some short films from director ryan mead um and a uh, array of different uh extended interviews with some different subjects and um other archival interviews and some uh unused like sequences from like um like conventions that weren't used in the, the film so this is a pretty well-rounded presentation. You get two documentaries and a nice array of vintage special features from Synapse Films, double-sided artwork, um, and yeah, just nice audio-visual presentation. So Invaluable is the better of the two documentaries in the documentary corner for me. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so I actually met uh, Tim, and he was actually really nice. Um, I know he has a pretty good reputation with fans so but yeah if if uh that does seem a little weird just being like tell me how great i am or i don't know yeah like i said i'm it, just the way that the participants would respond is like oh it sounds like he's behind the camera but then it's not like the movie's directed by someone else so i was just i was very confused but it just kind of did feel like he was very hands-on in the process so i just I, like I don't want to hit piece or anything. He seems like a great guy. I just yeah. don't. It just kind of that was the only part that I kind of I was like I don't know about this. <laughs> um. Yeah, but it sounds like there's like uh, a bonus uh, doc on there, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So my next film, we are going to get into the silent corner here. Yeah. Tin double feature. Um, this is from Kino Classics and also the Library of Congress. Um, did not know Rin Tin Tin was not the character name, but just the name of the dog. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, you knew that? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was thinking like Rin Tin Tin, like like that's a char- his character name. Like the dogs. I don't know. Whatever. Oh, it doesn't, okay. doesn't matter. Um, because I was like, he's playing Lobo, and I'm like, who the hell's that? Like <laughs> Rin Tin Tin. I don't know. I was so confused. Chime in in the comments if you also thought that. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> probably just me. That's fine. Just the um, Rin Tin cinematic universe. <laughs> it, well, I I don't know. It's very confusing. Um, so uh, I I before I get into this, I want to just say like if dogs in peril kind of make you uncomfortable or it's like a trigger thing, um, these might not be for you. Um. I think like my thing is humans weren't treated the best in um, silent films. So like dogs probably were like doubly not treated great. Um, And uh, yeah, so I'll I'll get into that a little bit more, but um, clash of the wolves is um, the first film, you know, it like starts out with a horrific forest fire, which I'm like, did they just, burn down a real forest for that i don't know (laughs) but i will say like there's a couple shots where like the dog narrowly escapes like burning limbs and stuff and i'm Mm -hmm. like fairly just certain that they were just like hucking burning things at this dog so that's a little distressing (laughs) and um yeah kind of i mean these definitely made for an uncomfortable watch just because like even like up until the 80s and 90s like animals weren't like very well treated in movies so you know in the early 20s you had to think like it's probably like double that um but um i think my biggest i mean outside of that my biggest problem with with the first film is they try to um it's you know it's an action adventure film there's some really great sequences the camera work on both of these films are really interesting and, and inventive. I mean, this is the early 20s. You know, the medium's still sort of growing and evolving. Um, so it's neat to see kind of like how the visual language was um, presented here. But they try to like cram in a lot of humor. And it's like not good humor. It's just really like cringe really not funny and it just totally derails the tone the plot i mean there's like this guy that's a big buffoon that we just have to make him the funny guy and it's yeah it was a lot uh so when the north uh begins is the next film or where the north begins sorry um is i think the better of the two they do kind of course correct a little bit of the humor that I thought was really awkward in the first film. Um, There still is that element of like dogs in peril and like moments where I'm like, "Mm, hopefully that dog was okay or taken care of. Um, But um, I feel like the dramatic stakes are a little bit more better realized in this film versus the first one. And um, overall, I feel like I just enjoy that a little bit more. There are times when it's like you're yelling at the TV because you like, you know, don't want this uh, outcome. And um, yeah, so it's fine. Um, again, I feel like both of these aren't very well paced. I think the second one is maybe a little bit better in that department as well. But um, they're still fine. But um, I I looked up how these movies actually did at the box office. And the answer is like really well, like they were made on fairly big budgets for the time between um, 70 to 100,000, but made double or triple that. So weirdly popular, Um, (laughs) I guess, since we know who Rin Tin Tin is, that tells you something. But Again, I swear I was like, that's like the character name, not the actual dog name, but I don't know. (laughs) So, yeah, (laughs) again, chime in. I can't be the only one that thought that, but maybe, maybe so. Mm -hmm. Um, These both look really good. I will say they're a little bit more like artifacts and debris, but you can still see where things have been cleaned up. Um, It's definitely not as... 
Um, I mean, I would I would have really loved to see like a maybe before and after of the restoration. I don't have that, so I can't really tell like how well it's been cleaned up. But I mean, you can tell everything looks overall fine. But yeah, you're not going to get something completely cr- uh, pristine like these. Again, where the North begins is 100 years old this year. So, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt. I think they did some really good uh, restoration work. These are um, 4K um, presentations, which I think is, well, Clash of the Wolves is is 4K, Where the North Begins is a 2K. And then it comes with a commentary track for Clash of the Wolves. So, yeah, really nice uh, if you are into Rin Tin Tin. The dog, not the character, evidently. Uh it's a good set. Yeah, that I've watched I watched both movies and they are wild in many respects. There were like moments where I called my wife in and I was like, Jessica, come here. You gotta watch this this stunt. <laughs> this is wild as hell. Like there was one, I believe it was in Clash of the Wolves, where like Renton Ten has like these shoes on. And he like takes a longer than natural time to like take his shoes off so he can run up this this little like uh like slide type thing to get to a roof to launch himself off to attack someone. <laughs> and I was like, this is wild. And I was like, come watch this. And I I was I mean I was very and other times I was very like concerned about the dogs and like how they no. were treated. But there were certain like stunt things that they would do like especially I think in the second one um, when he was like trying to like jump up into like this very high window i was like this is crazy so i understand like even now i'm like this is crazy so i'm sure it was blowing audiences minds back then so i i don't i don't fault them for going to see this crazy ass dog it was it was some wild stuff (laughs) yeah like i like in the first one i was kind of curious like how they made him like limp like Mm, when he was carrying his paw like that i was like yeah I was like, hopefully that's a trick. Like they didn't really just hurt this dog for this movie. Like I assume, even though it's not great, I assume it's something like whenever we were talking about the Francis movies where we like see like the uh mm. like wire mm. and stuff. Hopefully it's just like maybe they were kind of uh, pulling on its paw a little bit. I didn't see a wire, but I also wasn't like I don't know. I I just yeah, but just... it's good to let people know that you know yeah. if you yeah just be aware of that, but. Yeah, very they're, interesting. Yeah, uh, Peta wasn't all over film sets back then, so who who knows what was going on? Um, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, this shouldn't have any animal cruelty, but this is uh <laughs> from uh Paramount. It is the first season of yet another Yellowstone spinoff, 1923. Um, and this is one of the more exciting ones because it stars Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren. Like having such big names as part of your series is pretty awesome. Uh, probably because they like conceived it as a short term series. So this isn't going to be like 10 seasons. It's, I think it has one more season after this and then it's done. Um, one disc here, two di- stack disc here. Um, and uh, you get the kind of the episode descriptions underneath uh, if you take them out. So there you go. Um, so a eight episode first season over three discs so they're they're each they luckily don't try to cram too many onto one disc um so i i reviewed a couple seasons of yellowstone on here i reviewed the first spinoff which is 1883 with sam elliott and now we have 1923 so this is loosely connected to the dutton family from yellowstone like they're like a great uncle or something Mm -hmm. um but um what this really is is like a way to get i mean not that you need a reason to give uh, people to watch harrison ford and Hel- helen mirren on a small screen but uh it gives people a like a like a connection to watch this kind of western tale of where it's kind of it's in like the sweet spot between 1883 and yellowstone where the this this family is more established they do like have like this nice plot of land and this also creates a lot of problems from them because there's like a lot of like uh uh concern over how the land is used who can use it um what kind of limitations you can put on the land like like what is owning land basically and um 
this also kind of delves into like uh some of the mistreatment of uh, Native Americans at the time, like how they were forced into certain situations. And that's kind of explored as well, which is good because Taylor Sheridan uh, often doesn't like always present uh, beyond like a certain perspective. So I appreciate when he stretches himself and tries to like be aware that there's people beyond white people in like these these stories and tries to give them their own voice. Um, and it's just like a really good like it's made now but like a classic western tale of just like like deceit and um just kind of survival and just different it's it's steeped in human drama which i really appreciate both of like helen mirren and harrison ford do fantastic jobs um but the uh ensemble cast does really well too i was glad to see uh james badge dale who i've seen in several uh short-lived shows this one it will last a little bit longer for him but he does a great job there's also a lot of other good uh performers throughout um and just a really eight, uh, entertaining eight episodes it's among like the better of the like the yellowstone universe prop, uh, properties and this is also one I guess along with 1883 where yes you might get a little bit more like something if you enjoy, like if you watch Yellowstone but these are you can stand alone and just watch these as their own thing um so 1883 like it this looks really nice sounds great Dolby True HD 5.1 audio and it has over two hours of special features including like episode recaps different featurettes and like uh, interviews and everything so Really solid set from Paramount. Uh, good if you like the Yellowstone universe or if you don't, if you just like Western mm -hmm. tales, it's a fun show. Now, um, would you say this would be good if like, I, so I'm new to that series. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think would be good to just like start with? Like this one or another one? Um, I would say go based on how you feel about the ensemble. Like if you're more of a Sam Elliott fan, start yeah. back in 1883. If you mm -hmm. want just Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren, the, like they're both have their benefits. I think this one might be a little bit stronger narratively, um, but there there's some things going on with 1883. Like they're, I'm not going to delve too far into it because I'll probably talk about it whenever they eventually make it, but I think they're turning that more into an anthology show and going to be showing different perspectives in the future. Uh, but this is just like a two season thing. So it's neither of them are a huge commitment, no matter which way you go. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, yeah. I was kind of curious because I like, I mean, I like that. I'll, I, I like that cast. So that has me mm -hmm. like, that would probably be like the only reason I would probably be curious enough to, Check it out, yeah. but we'll see. Um, yeah, and they are on Paramount Plus if you want to sample it or just okay. watch it that way. So to decide if you do want to invest in physical media, yeah, which you always should. Um, Agree. Uh, so I have like nothing but stone cold classics from here on out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm talking about a um, two films uh, next, and that is Rio Bravo. And east of Eden. Ooh. Um, yeah, so in the back. No um reversible art. This just comes with the 4K disc. Um so um no slipcover and also um the uh, digital code will be in yours. Um mm -hmm. and uh same with uh east of Eden. And uh, just the Blu-ray disc. And yeah, so, uh, wow. Um, I think I'm going to start with Rio Bravo. Um, Howard Hawks is one of my absolute favorites. Um, if you uh, out there listening to this like John, um, John Carpenter, he is a mega fan. Um, he actually does a commentary track uh, on this release, which is cool. amazing. Um, yeah. Do you know if that's a port, a, a port over? Uh, or... Probably. I can check my copy. So just have the test pattern while I get my copy from up here. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, this has, yes, a port over of that and a couple okay. of featurettes. So you can list off what they have on there and I'll let you know if it is included. <laughs> um, 
so I believe it just has the commentary track. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so no, I, 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 I assume that that wasn't new, that that was poured over, but yeah, good to know. Um, yeah, so um, like if you uh, out there are like fans of like John Carpenter's The Thing and um, just everything that he's done, I mean, he's a horror fan, but I mean, John Carpenter definitely is a big Western guy. So yeah. Um, yeah this is incredible um by the time howard hawks made this um he was already kind of like the top of his profession uh so it's interesting to see him take a genre that was sort of in the decline um like westerns and really um take that and do something kind of really special and interesting um it's very traditional um they use a lot of very much like what you're used to, like iconography of Westerns, like saloons, um, the setting, all of that's very traditional. But um, what Hawks does is something that's a little bit more meditative, a little bit more methodical um, versus maybe some other genre offerings. Um, It's incredibly well paced, even though it's very Um, mellow at times Um, the action is incredible the opening scene is just Howard Hawks in his element establishing key plot points uh, and setting up the plot in these really complicated intricate sequences it also has Hawks's signature dry wit um, his very strong um, boisterous women which was another thing that you know, is a staple of, of Hawks's films, everything about it, just amazing. Like this, like the cast is incredible. Like you have such an eclectic sort of grouping. You have old guards like John Wayne, you have like the, one of the um, rat pack in Dean Martin, you have like teen idol, Ricky Nelson, uh, Angie Dickinson, kind of wild, but it really works. Like it's, such a cool cast. I just love everything about it. I love the setting. I love the humor. Uh, I love the heart. Um, just everything works uh, incredibly well. Have you seen this one? I shamefully have not, even though I've owned the Blu-ray for a long time. So once again, it's a 4K spurring me to actually watch these movies. So I'm glad they're coming out. I just, so little time. I need to actually watch <laughs> more of these movies i collect <laughs> yeah and this is a good excuse to get into it at the 4k the 4k looks fantastic you can tell they really did a fantastic job of not only having it look clean and clear and of course they didn't have the cinematographer to work with uh because this is an older film but you can tell that it is faithful to what they like were aiming for as far as like color correction tone um everything so looks great sounds great um the commentary track is just muh. it's mm-hmm. just chef's kiss it, it's really an entertaining commentary track anytime you get john carpenter doing a, a commentary track it's it's worth listening to full <laughs> stop so my next one is east of eden um just the back uh yeah another classic um it's kind of wild seeing James Dean in a movie since he only made like what four films and like when he uh, tragically passed away. Um, this is a really interesting retelling of the Cain and Abel story. If in fact East of Eden is um, where Cain and Abel were exiled to, um, and. Mm-hmm. This is just a sprawling epic in kind of every sense. Uh, It takes the story from Genesis and recontextualizes it uh, with uh, in the backdrop of the First World War. Um, Kazan presents um, the material in a way that's more complex and has more shades of moral, uh, morally gray. It's not just like, you know one's good one's bad one's destructive um it's many shades in between and i think it it really paints this compelling and at times kind of disturbing portrait um again everything about like just like rio bravo everything about this movie just clicks um the scope the scale the breathtaking photography 
Um, the actors, everything about it is fantastic. There's like some moments that are really just like kind of blow me away some of it's just because it's like um beautiful and breathtaking some of it's like because it's fucking wild like this guy smashes his head through a plate of glass and it's like uh it's really disturbing um but um now have you seen this one nope (laughs) (laughs) i know i know No, it's so great. I mean, with these other movies, I feel like sometimes less is more, sometimes more is more. But like both of these movies really find that sweet spot with the melodrama, with the action, with the characters, the complexity of the characters. Like both of these films really nail that in such a beautiful way. This also looks great. We do have um, another commentary track, which probably is another port over. Looks great. Sounds great. Love this. Keep them coming. Uh, more of these please um we just had um rebel without a cause uh in 4k so i'm like trying to think if we're missing any other like what was the other james dean movies i mean we already got i think this was the last of his three big ones because we had giant as well last year i believe Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah so that's awesome y'all need to check this out cinephiles like this is an absolute both of these are must own. Yes. And just for context for those, because one one criticism I do want to give towards Warner Brothers, and we were kind of touching on it earlier, is these are coming out 4K disc only. And in addition to that, they are just dropping a lot of their special features, even whenever they were porting over stuff like whenever they released singing in the rain there was like a whole disc for like in their collector's edition that they didn't include full of special features but like this rio bravo blu-ray it has a couple of more featurettes on here and mm. it's like a trailer gallery and some other stuff so uh and then this is the east of eden uh kind of digi book that i picked up a few years ago from dollar general so i haven't had this one as long but I'm glad to have it now because I also think it has uh, a wealth of like special features that uh, and just nice packaging that I'll, I'm going to keep this for sure <laughs> or both of these just for the special features. Uh, but Warner, give us just all the special mm-hmm. features. Don't make us like have to like build our own sp- like perfect release. It's just kind of getting annoying. Um, so that's just a little bit of cr- criticism. I want to lob at them. Get it together. I know you're giving us good like audio visually good releases but otherwise come on come yeah. on room for improvement yeah <laughs> uh but uh my final title uh, i hinted at this earlier this is from best draw the same mm. uh label that did candy man 3 is this one is bad no uh <laughs> this is uh my best friend is a vampire uh which you kind of understand what you're getting from that title you know what to expect from my best friend is a vampire it's kind of silly campy teen paranormal fun um uh this stars uh robert sean leonard who people may know best from house uh and uh, a pretty decent uh ensemble cast um this involves a guy who he's kind of uh he's encouraged by one of his friends to start like letting loose to get his mind off of like this girl that's been like haunting his dreams and stuff he's like you just need to like have like a one night stand and he ends up meeting this mysterious lady who he's like delivering something to with through his work and spending a night with her and then afterwards he's still he begins to experience some uh symptoms of that may uh, indicate that something's changing and that is he is a vampire he's turning into a vampire Hmm. uh and the the plot it developed about where you expect to go from there there's what i found very interesting is there's like these pair of like really intense vampire hunters that come onto the scene and just start trying to like track him down and like take him out and just the the degree of their intensity of like trying to execute their job is very amusing one of them is played by david warner but uh the main character he he kind of gets some guidance by an older vampire character which i will butcher his name but i do really like him as an actor i'm going to say renee abajona in today's video we are going to learn how to pronounce famous actor renee abajona renee 
Aubergeanois. Rene Aubergeanois. He recently passed away. I know him most from Boston Legal. I know he was on Star Trek for a while, one of the Star Trek series. But he's really great, and he's really great in this film. It's it's a fine movie. I would probably rate it like six out of ten. Like it does its job, but it doesn't really stand out in t- terms of like great like blending of horror and comedy. Like the classic Fright Night that we talked about last year. Like that's like kind of the bar because it's fantastic this one's just kind of like there's some good jokes there's some clunkers mm-hmm. there's some like it's 90 minutes but even then it kind of feels long in point at points and it just kind of meanders a little bit but it's not unpleasant it's just kind of like this is fine so if you're kind of just like looking for a baseline like enjoyable mindless time it's good but it's not it's it's squarely in the middle middle lower of that kind of subgenre of horror like the horror comedy paranormal teen flicks i would even rate something like my boyfriend's back is a little bit more fun than this one but Mm -hmm. it's decent um but this release i'm glad i got to see it i'll probably throw it on again uh, closer to the halloween just to see if maybe i'm i can give it another chance and see how if i evolve a little bit and that's that's when my my wife will be primed to see it because she'll be like yes more kind of lighthearted uh spooky offerings uh this blu-ray release it said it's digitally restored but anyone who's familiar with vestron knows that their digital restorations are uneven in quality like they're priced at a price point that's so low that you kind of be like okay i'll give them a pass but it's not fantastic restoration it like looks good but there's still little like specks of dirt and like different like signs of age-related wear and tear throughout so it could be better, but it's fine. Um, the audio is good. It has an audio commentary track from the director and a film historian, a couple of interviews, some trailers, a still gallery. So some nice special features and passable audio visual quality. Mm-hmm. Um, so overall, this this is probably around like 10 bucks. So if you're into it, it has a digital copy too. So go for it. But it's not one of my favorite from Best Run. It's kind of more in the middle ones that i've talked about on here so best friends of vampire it's recommended only if you're pretty sure you're going to like it already and not just taking a chance when you were talking about that it kind of made me like really upset that we don't have fright night 2 that is such a banger and like we need that but uh Mm -hmm. i am still curious i probably will end up picking this up at some point so my final title uh, I wanted to really end this with like the mm, that really good, like some may say great uh, title. Um, I think it's great. Ferris Bueller's Day Off 4K. Um, here's the the back, and we'll just take this J card off gently, and we'll get a. So there is nice. That's really cool. And here's the inside. I'll pop it out so you can check out the um, interior artwork. Um, Yeah, like that. Um, Yeah, Paramount uh, really does a nice job of these presentations. Um, Like it is really well thought out. Um, I'm not going to talk about this movie a lot. It's, you know, everybody kind of knows it, but um, John Hughes certainly was a force in the 80s and 90s he had a very specific brand of you know starting out as like teen comedy but his teen comedies had more complexity than a lot of other uh, people were were making like Hughes had that very cynical worldview but it also has this like beautiful kind of heart to sort of counterbalance a little bit of that cynicism and yeah this uh it just it it just works on every level. It's funny. It's got heart. Matthew Broderick in like a iconic role. Quotable. I don't know a single person that doesn't like this movie. The big thing is if you have the Blu-ray, 
is this worth upgrading? I think absolutely. I think that it does improve upon a lot of the, the issues that I have with the Blu-ray. I think like the coloring looks a little bit better. It looks a little bit crisper, a little clearer. I think the sound has improved. I think that like we're seeing a lot of these like 4Ks you were talking about last week with, was it So I Married an Axe Murder? How we're in a really good time when they're, you know, studios are going back double dipping and, you know, improving upon some of the, uh, I mean, I didn't think that the Blu-ray looked awful, but it had room for improvement. And I think like this really is it. I have no complaints. I think it's great. I love this packaging. Um, I love the movie. A lot of the uh, features are ported over. Uh, as you can see, I believe that they didn't leave anything out um, from previous the previous release. I, I think they actually added back a audio commentary that hadn't been available since maybe the DVD or something. Like, oh, nice. I think it was left off the Blu-ray. So I think it's the commentary from John Hughes, if I'm not mistaken, okay. that's okay. been added back. So I know that was very exciting for fans. Oh, nice. Uh, well, that's good to know. Um, and, you know, uh, sadly, John Hughes is no longer... Uh, with us but it's mm -hmm. great to be able to um you know hear him talk about the movie um the commentary track is very exciting uh it's great yeah this is a stellar release this is like a plus uh paramount really did a nice job yeah you have to double dip if you want the 4k but i think it's well mm -hmm. worth it i'm assuming you're a fan of this one yeah i've been wanting this one to get an upgrade for quite a while uh i mean I understand not hating the old Blu-ray, but it's very dated in many respects. So mm -hmm. it definitely needed a fresh master. So I'm glad we finally got one. It's funny because this used to not be like, it used to be like one of my least favorite John Hughes movie, but the older I get, the more I kind of appreciate it. I know like there's some like diehard fans. So this is like, really exciting. And I guess that's it. So, uh, you know, we always appreciate, right? <laughs> Yeah. The comments, the likes, um, all that stuff. It's really cool seeing that a lot of y'all are coming back. And, um, you know, we appreciate that. Uh, please subscribe. We do this every week. Besides that, we do a lot of other great content, interviews, reviews. As always, uh, thanks for hanging out with us.